people who go into the wine business, people who drink wine, I, I think by definition, people who love life, who love good food, who love having a great time. And that's where the fun is. I got involved in the wine business in 2002. My husband's family has been in the business here in Bordeaux for over 200 years. Um, I met my husband in New York, where at that time I was an investment banker for a company called Solomon Brothers. Um, I didn't know anything about wine. I couldn't tell you what a Cabernet Sauvignon grape was from a Merlot. I had no idea what went into a bottle of Bordeaux wine. This, this, is, de this is definitely a very sexy, elegant wine. <laughs> It's incredible. Look at you see the legs that it has on it. Black currants, a little bit of red fruits, not too much. I think this is unbeatable. You can put that on the back label. Very sexy wine. My closest relationships are with women producers. But when I say close, we are very close. We are friends. I can call them up and say, look, I need this or that, and I know I will get it, and they know they can um, do the same thing with me. I can depend on them. I mean, there's so much trust. There's a friendship and there's a trust. That has been what has made part of living in Bordeaux and working in Bordeaux fabulous, and I'm proud, proud to sell their wines. Life goes better with Bordeaux because I think Bordeaux can be enjoyed at every single moment in your life. Today we're skating with David Isaacson, a former hockey coach, a hockey fan extraordinaire, and a more than average skater. Matter of fact, these days David is taking skating to new heights. He's on stilts. What is with that guy? You know, what, how does he do that? What's, what's he doing? Is he crazy? Is he goofy? Is he silly? Or, you know, what's he thinking about? Why is he doing that and stuff like that? And I try to skate within my means. And that's what I always try to do, and I always try to make sure I can get as close to the crowd and more interaction with the crowd and uh, just uh, go out there and see some smiles and some, uh, some people that are having a good time. He does a great job. He gets himself prepared mentally and physically. I mean, yeah, I put the skates on, but he does all the work. I just kind of kind of talk to him a little bit and just make sure that he's got his head screwed on straight. You could go skate on stilts anywhere and for anyone. Where and who would it be for? Um, probably Montreal, because they have the biggest tradition in hockey. If I made it to the Canadians, that would be really, really something else. Inspired by the Maroon Loon skater, Too Tall Ike has worked hard with family and friends to hone in on this unique skill. Pr practice, practice brings confidence, and that's what I really needed, you know, at the, at the beginning of this and stuff, too, is, uh, you know, I was very unsure of myself and how this was going to work. You know, I, I've worked with Ike for 25 plus years and I was just encouraging him. I said, right on, let's go for it. There has been a couple tumbles. I'll have to admit that and stuff. And, uh, you know, both of the tumbles were on outdoor ice because that's where I was practicing was on outdoor ice. I try to stay away from outdoor ice now uh, just because it gets bumpy, it gets cracks and stuff like that. You can catch an edge on. But uh, I did take a couple tumbles and one did require a trip to the doctor. Last thing I tell them is, don't fall, by the way, don't fall. <laughs> but tonight, Too Tall Ike is not worried about falling. He's looking forward to scoring big with the dog pound. I think the fans, uh, the kids are going to uh, react pretty wild because you get a pretty good reaction even from, uh, from anybody, but that crowd is always brings it to the next level. So, While setting a new level of entertainment, Too Tall Ike is guaranteed to bring fans to their feet. Who knows, maybe even stilts. Somebody else, somebody else will take this at some point and, you know, take it like I saw after the Maroon Moon and say, hey, we got to give that a shot and stuff like that, so. For Husky Productions, I'm Kyle Fletcher. One, two, three, like a bird I sing, cause you've given me the most beautiful set of wings. And I'm so glad you're here today Cause tomorrow I might have to go and fly away Hey!
Marty Shermore and I'm the founder of Ticket to Music. When I was in the fifth grade, I wanted a guitar so bad, and my mom bought me a, uh, an airline guitar, which was by Montgomery Ward. And so I started picking up the chords off from the band the players and the, through the screen and watching how they played a D and a, and a G and a C. And, and uh, one thing I, I didn't realize was happening was I was left-handed upside down and backwards. And so I learned the whole, the whole process upside down, and uh, I never knew any different. And, and uh, so my, my, my right-handed guitar plays left-handed. I was, I was happy to know that some of the great uh, guitar players and rockers of the world, the Paul McCartneys and the Jimi Hendrix, were also left-handed. And so I came into a nice group. I'm not where near what they are. but um, I've been here at Faith Lutheran Church about 20 years, so it gets to be a long time uh, to be at one place. And I probably, the first thing I do when I get to church here is I greet uh, the staff and um, get that cup of coffee uh, that always kind of starts you out right. Uh, it's been good, and um, I like where I'm at, and uh, hope to finish out here and, and uh, retire here from here, and uh, we'll go on to the next part. But uh, as I always say, uh, you do, you're doing ministry every day, whether you're a banker or a school teacher or a college student or a logger or a farmer. So. When people say, "How you know you probably take the, the Sunday off," um, uh, that's not true. Uh, playing in the band and the music is is a gift, and it's a gift from God. And um, God wants me to use that talent. Anytime I'm out doing music on a Saturday night, um, I'm doing ministry actually, and I, I don't preach from the from the stage. Uh, but people are uh, are are close to me and. Uh, showing a healthy kind of fun for the night and bringing back those those good songs that they love to dance to um, is where I'm at. But then the next morning, and I might get in at 4, 4.30 in the morning, um, I need to get two hours of quick shut-eye, and this church is looking for me uh, to be wide-eyed and, and ready to go at uh, at 7.30 in the morning. And so when I when I do that that, that night, of, of traveling and playing, uh, I, I try to mentally uh, prepare myself, physically uh, prepare myself to be able to uh, be ready to go to the ministry. And so I'm grateful for what I do. I'm not sure how long I can do it. Um, I never thought I would do it again, uh, but it's been, it's been a good part of my life. It's, I call it kind of my therapy. And um, until you've been in a band, and I've been in the band business since the 60s, uh, you don't, um, don't always realize the depth of, of what it what it what it takes. I think I love you. Uh, my last song of the night is always "God bless" and I'll see you in church tomorrow. And uh, I know that most of them aren't going to be in church, um, but it is very important for me to to uh, to be at at where I really belong in the profession of ministry. And uh, um, it, it's. Uh, the people don't always know when I played a dance the night before. Um, one of the things our band is, is totally about is being a healthy band. Uh, we're not we're not uh, abusers of alcohol or uh, or substances, illegal substances. We don't do that. Um, at 56 years old, I need to know how to be in the very best of my shape uh, to go four hours and and rock it out. And uh, so I try to carry that on strong, and then carry it over into the next morning because I know that, that I need to be right on top of uh, the church and the happenings that, that uh, I go to on Sunday morning. So uh, the, people, the people are kind of, uh, I, I think that the, they like it that their, their minister uh, plays in this band. Girl, you really got me going. You got me so I know the what I'm doing. Footsteps in the hallway, scratches from behind a door. Welcome to Riverview Hall, where it's not what you see that gives chills, it's what you hear. Join us now and search for the truth behind the building's past as we stay the night in Riverview, listening for the whispers of silent souls.
Riverview Hall, home to the English department on the campus of St. Cloud State University. In its 96 year history, Riverview has been the center of much activity and regarded as an impressive landmark in architecture. Hello, I'm Kyle Fletcher and welcome to Silent Souls. Standing behind me is a beautiful building full of warmth and character. However, when the sun sets down and the shadows are cast, the building dramatically changes into a dark and eerie place where occasionally something unexplainable happens. Now, you can call it ghosts, you could call it hauntings, you could even call it fake. Either way, it is these events that have sparked our curiosity into exploring the mystery of Riverview's past. Our plan is to investigate the sources behind the building's fame and then to discover for ourselves exactly what it is Riverview has to offer. But before entering the building, you should know what you're walking into. Located in central Minnesota, St. Cloud is found on the west banks of the Mississippi River. Sitting on a foundation of granite, the city has stood strong throughout its history. Established in the 1850s, St. Cloud maintained order through the passing of Prohibition. When the Depression made its impact in 1929, only minimal hardships could be found. Throughout the years, St. Cloud has been known for its agriculture and regarded as one of the world leaders in granite production. <laughs> 